Hello everyone, welcome to our new video. In today's episode, we will hear from our late pastor, Mr. R.C. Sproul, on the topic of the narrow gate. As it is taught by our Lord Jesus Christ that the way to the kingdom of heaven is narrow and so many people fail to walk in through the way Jesus Christ taught us to walk. This message was originally delivered by Mr. R.C. Sproul on Legiona Ministries seminar. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now again, this is not my opinion. This is the teaching of the Lord Jesus. And he sets before his disciples two contrasts. A narrow way and a broad way, or a straight way and a narrow door, and a wide way and a broad door. And the other contrast is with respect to the number of those who go each way. Those who go the broad way that lead to destruction are many. Those who go the straight way to the narrow gate are few. Now, here's what I hear Jesus saying, that most, if not the vast majority of human beings that you know and that I know are on their way to hell. And if they were to die tonight, would go to hell. You would also say to me, statistically, that there's a significant number of people in this room right now who, if they died tonight, would wake up in hell. Because they're on the broad way that leads to destruction. Now, Jesus is not denying justification by faith when he says, strive to enter into the narrow gate, as he does here in Luke's version. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter, but they won't be able. They think they can get through the narrow door by living on Broadway. But here's the problem it gets worse. Jesus doesn't stop there about the few and the many, the narrow and the wide. But he said, when once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. They don't just say, who's ever in there, please open to us. They say, Lord, Lord, open the door. And Matthew's version, he said, they will say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do that in your name? And Jesus said, and I will say to them, who are you? Please leave, you workers of iniquity. Now, he knows cognitively, cognitively every one of those people that's knocking at the door, but he doesn't know them savingly. And so he says, you are not known by me in a redemptive way, so I can't hear your knocking at my door. 
It's too late. I can remember walking down a hall in a house back in Pennsylvania, and there was a mirror on the wall. And as I walked past that mirror, I caught a reflection of myself, which was not a pleasant experience. <laughs> but as I looked in the mirror, the thought struck me, what if you're deceiving yourself about the state of your soul? What if you are going to hell? I was terrified. Jesus said, Lord, open to us, and he will say, I do not where you're from. And you'll say, well, we ate and drank in your presence. We came to the Lord's table. We celebrated Holy Communion. You taught in our streets. I was there when you came through our village and healed the paralytic. I saw that. I was at the wedding feast at Canaan. I saw you turn water into wine. I've seen many things of mercy and grace that you have done. I tell you, I don't know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. And then he describes the nature of that place where they're going and the human response of being in hell. Do you ever wonder what people are doing who are in hell? Jesus doesn't describe every activity that takes place there. But he does describe two responses of humans who have been consigned there, where he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people, when they wake up in hell, will be devastated. And they won't find enough water in their eyes to satisfy their need to weep. They'll be sobbing. Oh, no! Not here! Oh, God, please have mercy upon me. Be the greatest disappointment they could possibly experience to wake up in hell. But then the other group will be there, won't be weeping a bit. They'll be gnashing their teeth, which is a biblical metaphor for human fury. How dare you, God, put me here? The angry, or the anger of the damned will know no bounds. Now, as I said, I sure don't want to end up in hell. But one thing I know for sure, that if I do, if I've deceived myself all these years, and if I'm one who says, well, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And he looks at me and said, please leave, I don't know you. And he sends me to hell. One thing I can promise you, that I'll be a weeper, not a gnasher. Because if I know anything about theology, I know that if he sent me to hell tonight, I could make no just complaint against him. I've been guilty of treason, cosmic treason. Every time I have sinned, I have asserted my will over the will of my creator. creator. I have declared that I am sovereign, not the Lord God. I've worked against his kingdom, not for it. 
I've sinned against a holy and infinitely righteous being who owes me nothing. And if I wake up in hell, I will realize I have only received what my life has merited. Not cruelty, not injustice, but perfect justice. I understand that. So I don't want to go there. I don't want anyone else to go there. Even though I love the majesty of God as a fallen human being, I have so much more in common with my comrades in the flesh. And so I have so much sympathy to think of anybody in hell. In fact, I don't think I, I would believe in hell if it were not taught so clearly by Jesus himself. Did you know that Jesus taught more about hell than he did about heaven? But I don't want to end on a hell of a note. <laughs> I want to go just a couple of verses before this, where in verse 18, Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree. And the birds of the air made nests in its branches. Jesus, every time we listen to you, you're talking about the kingdom of God. We don't even know what you're talking about. What's it like? And he says, what's well, like that almost infinitesimally small seed that you plant and you water? And then it pokes its little head through the earth, a little sprig that begins to grow and expand, not just to a bush, but to a tree of 10 or 15 feet high with a vast outreach of branches so thick that birds of all kinds of different varieties can come and nest in its branches. Not just land there for a few seconds, but build a nest in there. The kingdom of God is something that begins so tiny that it's imperceptible, but blossoms and blooms and grows and expands to the whole world. We are mustard seeds in a dying world. Not just a neo-pagan culture, a barbarian culture. But we are sons and daughters of the kingdom. We are sons and daughters of the King who takes every seed that we plant, every leaven that we put into the meal so that it grows and expands and fills the world. So in the final analysis, if we want to overcome the world, we don't have to worry how strong the world is. We don't have to worry how many pagans there are out there. All we need to know is who the king is. Because he's the one that will determine the destiny of this nation, this world, and this people. May you find yourself in agony, because that's the word Jesus used when he says, strive to enter in the narrow gate. The word agon, which means use a Herculean effort 
Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Your works will never get you into the kingdom, but once in there, you're to work with all of your might. And like pilgrim and pilgrim's progress, don't turn to the left or to the right. No matter how many obstacles, how many enemies, how much opposition, there's a door. You know, Christians were first called the people of the way. And it was the narrow way that leads to life. Tonight, as you put your head on the pillow, I plead with you to ask yourself, am I numbered among the few or the many? God grant that your answer will be among the few.